Hi, welcome to Pyrography Made Easy. I'm Brenda. In this tutorial episode, I'm going to show you how to create the look of denim fabric. This is the second installment of my mini project series. The purpose of the series is to focus on one or two skills and then use them in a project so you get a chance to use those skills in a meaningful way. The skills taught here are circular motion and uniform strokes. I consider these to be essential skills. I've used them in almost every piece of pyography artwork I've ever created. As always, there is a written tutorial and a free pattern on my website to help you with this project. The written tutorial covers some basic items like wood prep and tracing in the pattern to get the project ready for burning. I'm not going to cover those here. Instead, we will start with the pattern already traced on the board and ready for burning. The first thing we're going to work on are the dark seams along the edges. Let's get to work. Keep the end of the pin tip so it's on the lower piece of fabric. The top fabric has a folded edge that is stitched in place. The folded edge is thick enough to cast a slight shadow onto the lower fabric and that is what we are burning. Keeping your pin tip in this position is what I call optimal position. It ensures you can only burn on the lower fabric and not on the folded edge. With the seam lines burned in, the next thing we will work on is embossing the stitches. This means we will carve the stitches down into the wood so that we can burn over the top of them without darkening. I'm going to show you two tools to accomplish this. And the first is the card embossing tool. The card embossing tool can be found in craft stores and online. The other tool is to use the writer pen tip on super low heat. Creating the stitching is actually a little easier with the writer pen tip, but depending on the style of writer you have, there could be danger of damaging the tip. I discussed this in greater detail in the written tutorial. One more thing before we get back to work. During the embossing process, all of the pencil marks get shoved down into the bottom of the stitch. To keep the stitches as light as possible, remove most of the graphite by gently rubbing over the stitches with an eraser. Leave just enough of the pencil marks so you can see where you need to emboss. Let's emboss the stitching. I started with the card embossing tool. Take your time as you firmly press the tool into the wood and pull it towards you along the stitch mark to deeply score the wood. Try to leave a very small gap, about the size of a small dot, between each stitch. I am now using a writer pen tip to do the embossing. Make sure you have a very low heat setting when doing this. The heat will help the pen tip gouge into the wood, and if the heat is low enough, it won't color the wood. For reference, my burner goes up to 10, and I had the set on 0.5 when doing this step. If you place a small lamp above and to the side of where you are working, the light will illuminate the edge of the embossed stitching, making it easier to see what you've done. Since I'm left-handed, I place the lamp in the upper right corner of my work table. With the stitching embossed, we are going to burn in the basic shape of the shadows on the fabric. Our ultimate goal with this step is to erase the pencil marks. The pencil marks are right on the transition zone where the shadows start forming, or in depending on how you view it. Another concern is that graphite can smear, especially when rubbed over, and that would interfere with our pyography work. I use circular motion when I burned in the basic shadow shapes. So let me show you what I mean by that. 
as you can see, I am literally burning a continuous chain of small circles. Obviously, this is a highly exaggerated example for demonstration purposes only. My next burn is what circular motion really looks like. I'm still burning a continuous chain of small circles, but the circles are much smaller and closer together. This results in a solid looking band of color. My last example is a patch of circular motion. I don't lift the pin tip often while doing this, even when I change burn directions. One common feature of circular motion is that the color isn't uniform throughout the burn. There are often subtle irregularities within the area. To darken up a patch, all I have to do is burn over it using circular motion. Another feature of circular motion is how easy it is to extend the color. Just burning around the patch and this will soften the transition between the dark area and the surrounding area. And that's circular motion. As I mentioned in the demo, you can darken an area by reburning over it, but there's another way I want to talk about hand speed. It is really easy to get in the habit of constantly adjusting the heat setting on your burner to control how dark you are burning. Instead, use your hand speed to control the darkness. By reburning and altering your hand speed, you will gain so much more control and flexibility in your artwork. When I am burning, I very seldom change the heat setting on my burner. So let me show you what I'm talking about. This line is being burned in real time and I'm moving my hand pretty slow. This gives me a really nice dark burn. Whereas now my hand is moving much faster so the color is a lot lighter. Okay, we are ready to burn in the basic shadows. Keep the color within the tan to medium tan range. Remember, we are just lightly coloring the shadows so we can erase the pencil marks. Speaking of pencil marks, try to stay within the pencil lines when you're burning. Don't worry about making the color uniform. By keeping the shadows pretty light in color, we'll be able to darken them up to their proper levels after the pencil marks are out of the way. The last thing to do after you're all done with the shadows is to thoroughly go over all of the pencil marks with an eraser to remove them. Let's get to work. Pencil marks indicate where shadows are located on the fabric, so I use circular motion to lightly burn in the area between the pencil marks. Try to stay within the pencil marks. Keep the color of your burn in the tan to medium tan range. Don't worry about making the color uniform as we will adjust the shadows later after the pencil marks are gone. Again. The ultimate purpose of this step is to erase the pencil marks, so after the basic shapes of the shadows are burned in, thoroughly rub over the pencil marks with an eraser to remove them. I burned the fabric in sections and with the first section I began by burning uniform strokes to give it a base color. My definition of a uniform stroke is this. A uniform stroke is created by moving the pen tip at a set speed that allows the resulting burn to be the same color throughout the entire stroke. 
Our goal with the fabric is to create a base color of medium tan using the uniform strokes. How hot your pen tip is determines how fast you have to move your hand to keep an even color tone. I have a video to show you about this, but I first want to mention heat buildup. At the beginning of the video, you will see me tap my pen tip on a scrap piece of wood. I did this to remove any heat buildup. When your unit is on and the pen tip is just sitting, the heat builds up. This buildup can cause dark blotching on the wood when you first start to burn. So a quick tap or two on scrap wood takes care of the problem. Let's watch the video. Notice how I pull the pen tip towards me in a slow and controlled manner. When I start a new stroke, I burn it adjacent to the previous stroke. Each stroke should be touching or even slightly overlapping the other strokes. I prefer to use the side of my pen tip because it produces wider strokes and that means I get the area filled in more quickly. As I mentioned before, I burned the fabric in sections. The first section was the far right one marked on the photo as section 4, right here. I picked this section to start because it didn't have a lot of shadows. There is a seam running down the right length of it and a few horizontal wrinkles. A piece of folded fabric marks the left border of this section and there's a thin dark area along this border. Mostly this section is pretty flat, so we'll be using uniform strokes to give it a base color. Let's get to work. Start out with uniform strokes to give the seam a base color. I rotated the wood so I could easily see the edge of the seam and then I wouldn't accidentally burn past the edge. As you fill in the seam with base color, darken up the wrinkles you encounter. Obviously, each individual uniform stroke does not need to extend for the entire length of the seam. I find it's much easier for me to work in 1 inch or 2.54 centimeter increments. Rotate the wood and use the razor edge of the pin tip to burn a thin line along the right edge of the first row of stitching. Do the same with the second row of stitching. Use a writer pin tip to burn a tiny dot between each stitch. If there is room for more than one dot between the stitches, you can instead burn a dot at the end of each stitch. This means you will have two dots between the stitches, or you can just center one dot. I've done both methods and I think the single dot looks better, but I doubt anyone's really going to notice how many dots there are. For the rest of the fabric in this section, begin by darkening up the shadows. The top wrinkle has the darkest shadow but all of the shadows need to be at least one to two shades darker than the base color of the fabric. Rotate the wood to keep the pin tip in optimal position when burning in the dark area along the fold. Also, use really small circular motion to extend the color a little. Next, Burn the fabric to give it the base color using uniform strokes. I find that burning with the grain makes it easier to burn uniform strokes. The board I am burning on has horizontal grain direction, so keeping the board in this position makes it easier for me to burn. As you are filling the fabric with the base color, you might discover that some of the shadows need to be darkened up even more. Just reburn over them to fix the problem. Extend the color or the shadow just a little along the seams using really small circular motion.
The next section we will work on is the lower triangular area marked on the photo of section 5. Right here. This section has a little more going on. There are a couple shadows near the folded edge on the right, plus there are lots of little shadows along the seam that mark the edge of this section. Lastly, there is a small part of a pocket showing along the bottom. Well, let's burn in this section. Start by darkening the top shadow near the folded edge. Use circular motion to burn along the darkest area of the shadow and then blend the color out from there by burning lighter around it. And of course, to get an area darker, simply re-burn over it and adjust your hand speed if needed. Notice how I frequently re-burn small sections as I work. I often compare my artwork with the reference photo and then fine-tune areas that I notice aren't matching yet. Continue to work along the top of this section, burning in the shadows found there. Also, slightly extend the color along the seam. Now work on the lower shadow near the folded edge. Pay attention to how I build up the color and give shape to the area. I want to point out that both of my hands are on the board, so I'm not adjusting the heat setting to alter the darkness level. Instead, I reburn and or alter my hand speed. By doing this, you can get a large range of color hues in your work similar to those in this video. Don't forget the little pocket. Use uniform strokes to give it a base color and burn around the stitches just like we did in the first section. Now we're going to work on the little triangular area marked on the photo as section 3. Right there. This section has a seam running along the bottom of it and a large shadow fills most of this section. Well, let's get to work. Again, start by burning the darker areas on the shadow. Work your way around the shape of the shadow, consulting the reference photo often. You may have noticed that I took a break from working on the large shadow area and then went back to working on it. I find this helps me view the area with fresh eyes, so I evaluate my work better when I return. When working near edges, make sure to rotate the board to keep the pin tip in optimal position. Another benefit of rotating the board is that it forces your brain to readjust to what the eyes are seeing. This can make it easier to determine what areas need to be darkened. Oh, and make sure to rotate the reference photo so it matches the board. This will make it easier to compare the two. 
notice how I build up the color levels fairly slowly by reworking areas a lot. I take my time and I consult with the reference photo frequently. Even though this section is pretty small, there is a fair amount of stuff going on. Take your time with it. Check the reference photo frequently. Rotate your board to evaluate the art at a different vantage point. Mostly, just keep at it and you will get the section done. The next section of fabric we will work on is the largest area marked on the photo as section 2, right through here. It has a lot of shadowed ridges or wrinkles in it, and there's a seam running along the lower portion of this section. Let's get to work. Start with the large shadow on the lower right ridge. When you burn, remember to consult the reference photo and ask yourself questions. Are the shadows dark enough? Is the shape correct? Are the light areas staying light? Are the transitions smooth? These are the type of questions that run through my brain as I'm burning and I compare my artwork with the reference photo. Continue to build up the shadows along the right ridge. Notice how I work and rework areas as I adjust the color levels. This method of slowly building up the color gives a lot of tonal depth because of the subtle layers of color. Plus, it is much easier to darken a burn than it is to lighten it, especially on wood. I know I already stated this, but ever so often rotate the board and the reference material. Doing this really does help you reevaluate your work as the image isn't as familiar now. This process can make it much easier to compare your work with the reference material and see what still needs to be done. I started out trying to replicate the photo seam wrinkles, but that was very tedious given their size and quantity. 
I quickly realized that all I had to do was burn a lot of wrinkles and that would give my fabric a realistic look. Our very last section is the top of the fabric, which is section one on the photo, right along there. This one has a little pucker ridge near the center, a tiny pocket or something is above that ridge, and there's a seam that runs along the entire lower section. Let's get this artwork finished up. The last section isn't much different than the others. Wrinkles get burned in between the stitches, the stitches get lines burned on either side of them. The shadows get darkened up using circular motion. The fabric is burned to the base tone with uniform strokes. The pin tip is kept in optimal position when burning along edges. Use varied hand speed and reburning to control the darkness levels. And consult the reference photo often. The very last thing to do is to burn the tiny dots between the stitches. I had skipped this step on a few of the other sections, so I made sure to take care of those sections now. We are all done. As I said in the beginning, I consider uniform strokes and circular motion to be essential burning skills. The next time you're watching a pyrography video, ignore the art and concentrate on the hand movement of the artist. At some point, you will most likely see one, if not both, of these burn types being used. Now let me clarify that I am talking about videos where the artist is creating something more than a simple line drawing or a silhouette. In the remarks below, I have provided a link to the written tutorial on my website, Pyography Made Easy. The written tutorial has the pattern and the reference photo that I used for this artwork. Now to answer a couple questions I get asked a lot, I use a Colwood Super Pro 2. The artwork was burned on a piece of die cut birch plywood and it took me five and a half hours to complete it. Thank you for watching and please subscribe.